uh, Las Cancorla. I think it's uh, very useful, Las Cancorla, that we have the opportunity uh, to speak today about COVID and the impact it's having and the restrictions are having since the country moved to level five on uh, Wednesday evening. I also think it's important we keep a broad understanding of where we are uh, as a country in terms of trying to resolve these issues and trying to measure our approach to the COVID pandemic. It has to be pointed out that there is a second wave of COVID happening throughout Europe. Uh, we're not unique in respect of this matter. If you look throughout Europe, uh, whether it's Germany or the Netherlands or the United Kingdom or France or Spain, you can see that the cases, the positive tests of COVID-19 have been rising significantly in the past uh, eight weeks or so since the beginning of September. I think it's also important to point out that if we were here a number of weeks ago, people would be praising countries such as New Zealand, Australia, but they'd also be mentioning Germany as a European example of a country that was doing particularly well. However, what we can see is that this is a virus that moves very quickly, and no matter what great measures you have in place in your state to ensure that it is kept suppressed, you can't fully control it. And that's what we see from what's happened in Germany uh, in recent weeks. I also think we need to recognise that Ireland has to be realistic in terms of what we can achieve in our response to this pandemic. I listened to Deputy Murphy speak earlier on about the elimination strategy, not necessarily getting it to zero, but trying to eliminate the transmission of the disease. My own assessment is that that is not feasible. And I think if you look at what we did in Western Europe throughout this year, you can see that it's most unlikely to occur. Because throughout Europe, we had the first phase, which took place in March, April and May. And then in most of Europe, we got the figures down very low in the summer months of June, July and August. And they rose again throughout Europe in the autumn months. So what it does reveal to us is that this is an extremely contagious and infectious uh, disease. And no matter what efforts are put in place by a government, it's extremely hard to control it. I know people now are referring to what's happening in Australia and New Zealand as being examples of countries that we need to follow. I think it's instructive to note, however, that although New Zealand had recently very significant successes, that in the past number of days there have been cases, positive cases, of COVID uh, in New Zealand. So I think we need to have a broad perspective of this, that this is the disease that's going to be with us and we're not going to be able to eliminate it in the same way as we haven't been able to eliminate other diseases such as flu, even though we have a vaccine uh, for it. Now, I think it's always important when you're discussing how the country's coping in respect to the virus that you don't concentrate exclusively on the cases. Because as we know, significant numbers and significant percentages of people who test positive for COVID-19 are asymptomatic and aren't in any way that could be described as being sick. Nonetheless, there's obviously an importance to knowing about those figures because they can transmit the virus. But I always think it's much more important to look to see, well, how many sick people are there in the country at present arising from the COVID pandemic? And in order to do that, you've really got to look to see is what's the hospitalizations. And today, the number of people in Ireland who are in hospital with COVID is 311. And of that 311, 37 people are in intensive care. And let us look to see where we were a week ago, because a week ago there were 244 people in hospital with COVID issues, and of that number, 30 of them were in intensive care. And let's look to see where we were two weeks ago. And two weeks ago, there was 179 people in hospital with COVID-19, and of that 179, 31 were in intensive care. And it's the reason I refer to this is that it's very unfortunate that these people are in hospital and I wish them all a speedy recovery. But I think we need to recognise that the rate of increase of hospitalisations and the rate of increase of people being admitted to ICU is different to what it was back in the first wave. For instance, as I say, two weeks ago, there were 31 people in ICU with COVID, whereas today there are 37. And let's go back to the time in March and April when the disease was at its most uh, dangerous up to now. 
And the 27th of March was the day upon which we were told to stay at home. And on the 27th of March, there were, I think, 380 people in hospital with COVID, and of that, 68 of them were in intensive care. The week after that, there were 704 in hospital, and 137 of them were in intensive care. And the week, two weeks, a week after that, the 11th of April, there was 856 in hospital, and 155 in intensive care. So what is apparent in this country and what's apparent around Europe at present is that although the cases are significantly larger in their quantity than they were in the first phase, the hospitalizations and more importantly and more fortunately the deaths are not at the same level as they were in the first phase. Every death of COVID is a very traumatic event for any family member, and I pass on my condolences to anyone who has suffered a bereavement in respect to this matter. But when you look at where we were in April, uh, last in that month, 1,176 people died of or with COVID. And I think to date, in October, there are approximately 67 people who have died of or with COVID. So we're dealing with different, a different strain a different uh, impact of the virus in this second wave than we were in the first wave. There are more cases, but the hospitalizations, the ICUs and the deaths are considerably lower. And I think that is a factor that has to be taken into account when we come to assess, well, what public policy measures should we input in order to respond to the virus? Um, as I mentioned, uh, it is Wednesday evening that new restrictions came in and the country went to level five. And listen, that was a very difficult decision for the government, but it was a decision that was made by the government. And I'm a government TD, and I recognize that it's a decision that the government deserves support of from their uh, TDs. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to try to ensure that level five works. However, I think it's also important to point out that people in Fianna Fáil and other parties are entitled to express their own views. I think, as you will appreciate, ask Count Corla, there is a danger in the fact that every party in the Dáil seems to express the same policy in respect of the restrictions. And I support what the government's doing, but I think we have to be very careful as a political body that we don't allow groupthink to enter into our deliberation. We need to keep our horizons broad we need to consider, well, is this the correct strategy? And we need to probe strategies in this Legislative Assembly so that we can try and achieve what all of us want to achieve, which is the best outcome for the Irish public. My concern about the restrictions and going to lockdown five is that, yes, it probably will reduce the numbers by the 1st of December, but inevitably after that, they will rise again and we can find ourselves going back into another lockdown in February. That's not a sustainable solution. It is not acceptable for the people of this country to be exposed to uh, lockdowns every three or four months. And I think it is not consistent with what we're trying to do in this House. What the government is trying to achieve, what all of us are trying to achieve, is we're trying to ensure that we can live with this virus, which unfortunately is going to be with us for quite a period of time. The reason I'm concerned about the impact of level five restrictions is because it has negative consequences. And I suppose the thing about the virus is we can see very immediately the negative consequences that arise from the virus. We see it in the 1,800 deaths. We see it in the hospitalizations. We can see immediately what are the consequences of COVID on the community, on, the, on, on people in nursing homes, on care homes. But what we don't see at present are the consequences of the, um, of the restrictions. And they are something that we need to consider because it's one of the functions of a politician to be able to try to see ahead so you can assess, well, what are going to be the consequences of any decision we make? As I've mentioned before, I'm extremely concerned about the consequences the restrictions are going to have on the mental health of people in our society. I'm also extremely concerned about the consequences that the restrictions are having upon the lives of young people. I've mentioned this repeatedly before in the Dáil. I mentioned it as far back as the beginning of May. But in effect, we can't ignore the fact that the education, the employment, the entertainment, uh, the travel and the relationships of young people have all been affected. Now, that isn't to say that no restrictions should be in place, 
But they are certainly factors that should be taken into account. Like we know that there are people who have started their university experience and their university experience is they're sitting at home looking at a laptop, looking at lectures coming online. Uh, also, when you look at employment, youth unemployment in this country is now at 37%. We need to recognise that all those people who lost their jobs from Thursday morning, a significant number of them were young, low-paid workers. And I don't think we can sustainably continue in the long term with repeated policies that are so damaging to the lives of young people. And it's something that we have to factor into our deliberations. And then there's also the economy. Like, when people talk about the economy, sometimes people think, oh, you're balancing the economy against individuals' health. I'm not, and anyone who talks about the need to protect the economy isn't either. The important reason we need a functioning economy is so that we can pay for a health service, so that we can ensure we have all the other vital services provided as well. So I think what is really important is we need to consider the repercussions that the restrictions are having that may not be evident today, but will become evident into the future. What we really need to prioritise, however, at Ascan Corla, is we need to ensure that we protect the vulnerable and the elderly, who are the people who have suffered the most as a result of this pandemic. And that, in particular, means we have to ensure that our nursing homes are protected, that our care homes are protected, that the elderly in our community are protected. And irrespective of what level we're at, whether it's level 2, 5 or 25, we have to try to do that. Because there's no point in saying we've gone to level five, that means the elderly are protected. They won't be. We need to ensure that care homes around the country and nursing homes are fully protected and we need to have a protocol put in place to ensure that the elderly people there are so protected. The reality is, however, that's Count Corla, we're never ever going to be fully and completely able to protect people from this dangerous virus. No country in the world has been able to do it and I don't think we should place unrealistic uh, goals before us when we know they can't be achieved. Listen, I'm conscious, and I just want to conclude in this as well, that there has been political controversy that has arisen because of the dichotomy and divergence between Neffet and the government. And, you know, in fairness to the people in Neffet, I think it's important that we emphasise that Neffet is a body of advisers. They are civil servants within the Department of Health and HSE who provide advice to the government, and in particular the Minister for Health, on the issues pertaining to COVID. They also are responsible for coordinating our response to COVID. It is wrong, however, to uh, allow, in the political realm, NEFET to be presented as the decision-making body. It's not. The government is the decision-making body. It is a group of advisers, and we need to recognise that, and the public needs to be informed of that, because if we don't do that, there will, resentment will grow amongst the public against NEFET, which is an unaccountable body. So we need to see more of the Minister for Health and, indeed, Minister Rabbit, who I see here, and uh, you know, they need to really be leading it. The politicians need to lead the public face of this because Thank it's you. politicians who are accountable and they can be removed Gar by the public if we fail. Thank, Thank you. you.